Hello everyone, good morning. Hope you are all doing well. Welcome to the last day of our International Symposium on Biological Sciences. So the, to start the section today, we have um, Professor Tiago Januário da Costa. He is a biologist, master and PhD in biological science at the Focus in Pharmacology at the Institute of Biomedical Science of the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. The main projects focus in the functional and molecular study of the mechanism of action of sex hormones, especially estrogen and testosterone, on the cardiovascular system in models of postmenopause aging and arterial hypertension. Is a visiting researcher at the Department of Pharmacology, Therapeutics and Toxicology of the Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona and at the Institute de Investigaciones Biomedics Auguste P. Sunier at the Universidad de Barcelona, participating in basic and clinical science projects aimed at seeking the effect of DNA methylation, alternative splicing of estrogen receptors, and microRNA in the development of cardiovascular disease in postmenopausal women. So, Tiago, thank you for accepting being here with us today, and welcome, please. You can start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I start my presentation. So, thank you so much for invitation to present my work and that all collaborators. It's a big pleasure to be here and to talk about uh, SARS-CoV-2 and cardiovascular system. Uh, I don't have conflict of interest in this presentation. So, the endothelial cells is a monolayer cells present in the, all in the lumen of all vessels and promote a crucial interface between blood and different tissues. Under a physiological condition, endothelial cells promote vasodilator or vasoconstriction, promote antioxidant, uh, increase the antioxidant system, uh, anti-inflammatory response, and uh, control the vascular permeability. In the physiological injuries, for example, high blood pressure or atherosclerosis, the function of endothelial cells change and induce the cardiovascular disease. It's very interesting that the cardiovascular disease is a common comorbidity present in COVID-19 patients. In this study, suggests that 15% of the patients with COVID-19 present hypertension and 13% uh, present in coronary artery disease. In addition, during the hospital stay, 32% of the COVID-19 patients need to vasopressor support to control the blood pressure. In addition, this study suggests that uh, four important biomarkers of cardiac injury was associated at death in COVID-19 patients. So, this result suggests that an important correlation with cardiovascular system and SARS-CoV-2 infection. Uh, several studies suggest that the cardiovascular system, specifically the endothelial cells, uh, changes uh, after the SARS-CoV-2 infection. The first study Oops. The first study showed the blood flow decreasing in COVID-19 patients and disease increased the risk of thrombosis. In next talk, my colleague Simone uh, will talk about how the plasma from COVID-19 patients induced degradation of important proteoglycans present in the endothelial cells. So, the SARS-CoV-2, the, uh, the coronavirus, the spike protein present in coronavirus, is, is uh, responsible to 
attachment in the ACE2 present in the host cells. After this bind, a specific protease, TIMP2, cleave the, the per, spy protein and contribute the fusion of the virus in the host cells. After this, the virus enter in the cytoplasm and uncontrolled SARS-CoV-2 infection in, in, uh, initiated and induced cytokine store whereby pro-inflammatory response over produced by immunosystem. This phenomenon induced angiorgan disease, including the cardiovascular cyst. It's very important to mention that this cytokine storm is mediated by toll-like receptors. The humans present about 10 toll-like receptors, and in 2019, uh, Ashen and co-authors suggest that the mitochondrial DNA induced toll-like receptor activation and cardiovascular dysfunction. Their date uh, showed the spontaneous hypertension increase the mitochondrial DNA compared to normal tensive rates, and in turn, the under uh, adrenergic stimulus, mitochondrial DNA increased interleucin 6 and TNF alpha, and this increase induced vasoconstriction. It's very importantly that the OGN2088, a toll-like receptor antagonist, decrease the vasoconstriction induced by mitochondrial DNA. So, this result suggests that the mitochondrial DNA is important agonist to toll-like receptor 9, and this receptor induces the vascular dysfunction. Uh, to explore this idea about SARS-CoV-2 and cardiovascular disease mediated by toll-like receptor, the hypothesis of my work is the SARS-CoV-2 infect endothelial cells, promote the mitochondrial dysfunction, and increase mitochondrial DNA release. In turn, mitochondrial DNA induces toll-like receptor signally and an important downstream to induce the inflammation. To explore um, the, this hypothesis, we, we use the UVEC cells infected by SARS-CoV-2 for 48 hours, plasma from COVID-19 patients and the respective controls, a force for functional studies, we use mice. So, my first question is, does SARS-CoV-2 infect endothelial cells? For this, we evaluated the protein levels to ACE2 and TIMP2, two important key uh, to infect the cells, and we observed that uh, both ACE2 and TIMP2 are robust expression in endothelial cells. In fact, using the specific antibody to detect SARS-CoV-2, we observed that the, the presence of the virus in endothelial cells, however, this infection is lower compared a to positive control, the viral E6 cells. It's very interesting, it's very important to talk about the SARS-CoV-2 infect endothelial cell, but does not replication in endothelial cells. So, the next question is associated to SARS-CoV-2 and the mitochondria function. Using mitosox red, a specific uh, superoxide indicator in mitochondria, uh, we uh, evaluated the raw generation in mitochondria. In this panel channel, we observed the representative ima image, and the graphic, we observed that the inactivity and SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection increase the fluorescence to mitosox compared to control mock, we observe in the same the same in the representative images. In this experimental protocol, 
we use it uh, rotenone as a positive control because the rotenone is a strong inhibitor of complex one of the mitochondria and the inhibitor of complex one increase the raw generation. It's very interesting that SARS-CoV-2 decreases the protein levels of complex one compared to control mock, suggesting that it is a possible mechanism that increases the raw generation in SARS-CoV-2 infection. <clears throat> in next step, we evaluate another uh, mark for mitochondrial dysfunction is a membrane potential by mitotract red probe. And we observed that the SARS-CoV-2 infection increased the fluorescence by mitotract compared to inactivity virus in mock control. The same was observed in the representative images. Uh, the, in the mitochondria, the VDAC of voltage-dependent anode channel is an important channel to control the membrane potential in the mitochondria because this channel regulates a flux of different ions, including the calcium. And it's very interesting that SARS-CoV-2 decreases the protein levels of VDAC compared to MOC, suggesting that this increase of the potential of membrane was associated to uh, low levels of the uh, VDAC channel. In fact, we tested the role of the calcium in endothelial cells uh, and with a specific probe to detect acetosolic free calcium. And we observed that in UVEX infected by SARS-CoV-2, the response in the response of calcium is low compared to inactivity virus and control mock, suggesting that the changes in VDAC channel contribute to reduce the response to calcium in endothelial cells. In addition, we observed, we evaluated the ATP induced calcium in endothelial cells. However, this phenomenon was abolished in the cells infected SARS-CoV-2. So, this result suggests that all mechanism to control the calcium in the endothelial cells was abolished in the presence of the SARS-CoV-2. The next step, uh, we evaluated if that the mitochondrial dysfunction contribute to the mitochondrial DNA release. First, we evaluated the integrity of the membrane plasmatic and we observed that the SARS-CoV-2 infection increased the degradation of membrane compared to respective control, and the toll-like receptor antagonist, the OGN2088, decreased the membrane plasmatic uh, degradation. It's very interesting because this in the UVEC cell infected by SARS-CoV-2, increase both marks of the GNA mitochondria compared to respective control. In addition, we observed the, the same phenomenon in the patients infected by SARS-CoV-2, patients with COVID-19, compared to comorbid patients and compared to health patients. It's very interesting result because suggests that the SARS-CoV-2 induced mitochondrial DNA release in vitro stud studies and the in vivo uh, studies. So, the first part of this study uh, demonstrated that the SARS-CoV-2 infect endothelial cells and promote the mitochondrial dysfunction because increased raw generation and membrane potential. This phenomenon increased mitochondrial DNA release. And my next step, my next question, I evaluated the if mitochondrial DNA induced toll-like receptor 9 activation. First, uh, we evaluated the protein levels of toll-like receptor 9 and we observed that the SARS-CoV-2 infection increased the protein levels of toll-like receptor compared to respective control. And in addition, 
we observe that the inflammatory response mediated by NF kappa B was higher in SARS-CoV-2 compared to respective control. Uh, we evaluate the total and the phosphorylate NF kappa B. It's very interesting that the antagonism of toll like receptor 9 decreased the protein levels if, uh, if total and phosphorylate NF kappa B, suggesting that the toll like receptor 9 mediated the inflammation. In fact, we evaluated the levels of EL6 and we observed that the SARS-CoV-2 increased the levels of this uh, interleucine compared to respective control and toll like receptor 9 antagonism decreased the production of IL6. We evaluated to the production of thromboxane and endothelin because there's a two important vasoconstriction. And the result is very interesting because the SARS-CoV-2 infection increased the thromboxane production and decreased endothelin production. However, both uh, changes is not dependent of the toll like receptor agonist receptor. Uh, uh, last, for evaluated the role of mitochondrial DNA in the vascular dysfunction mediated by toll like receptor 9, we uh, evaluated by vascular reactivity the, vas the aorta function of the mice, and we observed that the incubation of mitochondrial DNA induced vasoconstriction compared to respective control and positive control with a genomic DNA. It's very interesting that this, this vasoconstriction was abolished in the toll-like receptor 9 knockout mice. So, this result suggests that the release of the mitochondrial DNA induced vascular dysfunction mediated by toll-like receptor 9. So, in conclusion, this result suggests that the SARS-CoV-2 infect endothelial cell, but does not replicate it, induced mitochondrial dysfunction and mitochondrial DNA release. In turn, mitochondrial DNA release induced toll-like receptor activation, increased the production of IL-6 and induced um, endothelial cell dysfunction. I would like to thank all group involved in this uh, project, especially the postdoctoral fellow in Ribeirão Preto Medical School. I would like to thank uh, Professor Rita Tossi in Ribeirão Preto Medical School and her group. I would like to thank Professor Natasha Zahara in Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in your group. And thanks so much for FAPESP, CAPS, and CNPq for uh, uh, financial support. Thank you for your attention and open the questions in Portuguese or English, English no problem. Okay, Thiago, well, thank you for pleasing us with such a great results. And we know that talking is faster than typing. So why do people take a little while to type the questions? Um, I would like to make one. Oh, sorry, we have two questions here already. So Professor Diego Colunacci is asking why you try to investigate different variants of SARS-CoV-2. And Dr. Carlos Castro is asking, he's uh, congratulating you on a very nice presentation and asking, is there some explanation for why SARS-CoV-2 does not replicate in endothelial cells? Uh, so the first question, I don't investigate the, another variant because I started this project in the first variant, but it's a very good point that the second variant induces the same dysfunction, but I, I, I don't evaluate. This is a, the first coronavirus, the first sequence of coronavirus. The second question, I don't see the second question. Uh, explanation is a very good question about the replication of the cell. In fact, I don't know. I have a different hypothesis, 
Uh, there are a preprint about the SARS-CoV-2 needs the glutamine to replication. And in UVEX cells, the, the glutamine concentration is low. It's a possible to, to do replication in, in UVEX cells. But I need you to more investigation to understand the, the physiological condition of endothelial cells that contribute, they stop the replication of the virus because it's a specific endothelial cells. So my first hypothesis associates the glutamine, but I need more investigation about this. Okay, Chad, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I've, I've seen a um, lot of uh, hypotheses on the role of range in angiotensin system in the, the, the process, the pathophysiology of SARS-CoV-2 and starting with the ACE2, the connection of the ACE2 with the spike protein and all this stuff. So do you know whether uh, already there is um, a bunch of data showing that patients taking drugs interfering with the renin angiotensin system like losartan or captopril, if this interfered with the pathophysiology of the disease is a, is a very good question. Uh, in most cases, the, the use of antihypertensive treatment uh, inhibits the ACE, the ACE1 enzyme, no ACE2. I, I think that is a important correlation is uh, the virus enter in the cells by ACE2 and developed independent of pharmacological treatment. In most cases, for example, in, in studies, we showed all patients, patients used antipertensive treatment and the progress, the, the disease is the same. So I think is a, the pharmacological treatment is important to control the blood pressure, but don't inhibit the, the virus entering in endothelial cells and contribute the dysfunction. So it looks like ACE2 is the single point of the system which is involved. Yes, okay. the single point. Okay. We have more questions? We have time for more questions? Wow, well, yeah, I have many times. <laughs> so uh, I have another question, Thiago, um, about the involvement of the nitric oxide and reactive oxygen species. So you showed a lot of endothelial data and what would be um, the involvement of these two molecules in the pathophysiology of the disease in endothelium? Yes, I, we will evaluate the protein levels of enos and the enos decrease and consequently decrease nitric oxide production. I think this is a, another mechanism to increase vasoconstriction. I think that in next talk, Simone talk uh, about the nitric oxide production in the endothelial cells treated with plasma from COVID-19 patients. But I think that the nitric oxide is involved in, in the vascular dysfunction too. So do you have uh, access to any data showing that the antioxidant therapy changed the course of the disease? It's a very good point. I don't read about, but it's a very complicated because I study aging and all the studies, the antioxidant treatment doesn't inhibit aging because they are a physiological increase the loss important to control the, the vascular turn, turn, uh, tunnels for the aging, the aging process. I don't know. I think that is uh, antioxidants is a not good treatment for in, impact the virus, the virus infection. So it's not going to change the yeah. surveillance or something. Yeah. Okay. We have another question from Dr. Fernanda Giacchini. Thiago, how was the experience of working with the COVID-19 during the pandemic? Well, very complicated because I stopped my postdoc project. Uh, and I will start uh, work with COVID-19. I don't understand about virus. I, stand, I, stand, I understand about this cardiovascular disease. So I start the new talks in my career 
I changed the country. I, sta I started the postdoctoral in United States in the pandemic is very complicated because uh, all universities closed. Uh, so it's a very complicated, but it's, I need to change my focus in this moment to respond to uh, uh, this global problem, but it's a very complicated. Sure. Looks like Dr. Fernanda has another question. Um, African Americans were much more committed by COVID-19 in USA. Anything related with variations of endothelial cells? Ooh, Fernanda, is a very good question. In this moment, in United States, talk about all the time uh, uh, with the cardiovascular disease in America, in African America, and the white people. Aqui, uh, in United States, talk white people and black people. It's very interesting because the black people uh, present a high blood pressure compared to white people, and this is a is a is a important to increase the risk of the coronavirus infection or develop the consequences after the SARS-CoV-2 infection. I don't know. I don't know about the AC2 variant or virus variant. Uh, infection different black people and white people, but the the cardiovascular system is very different, and because of this, I think the the develop of disease is very different. But it's a very good point. It's a very good point. Thiago, I, I got a last question, and um, it's a technical question. What is the risk of your infection dealing with these samples in the bench? No, I no, I, I worked in a specific laboratory, uh, safe number three, with a uh, different mask, different clothes. Is a uh, specific. I, I developed all experiment in this laboratory. Okay, hope you stay healthy. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. So, guys, we have more questions. Okay, so Thiago. Once again, thank you for being here with us today. And very nice work. It's very relevant for our future. Thank and you. Thank you for this as well. Thank you. Once again, thank you. We can proceed with the next presentation. OK. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate the organizing committee for the excellent choice of the speakers. Uh, it's a pleasure to participate together with the Professor Carlos Xavier as coordinator of the session. Uh, and uh, the next lecture will be given by the Professor Simone Regina Pod, who is a biologist and earned both master's and PhD degree in physiological science at the, at the State University, at São Paulo State University, UNESP, Júlio de Mesquita Filho, by the Multicentric Graduate Program Programa Multicêntrico de Ciências Fisiológicas da SBFIS. She spent a period at the University of Illinois during her PhD. Later, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of São Paulo, with periods of visiting scholar at the University of Illinois and at the University of Arizona at Tucson. She had also a researcher position at the Indiana University, and currently she's a professor at the State University of Minas Gerais, Universidade Estadual de Minas Gerais. Uh, Professor Simone works in the area of cardiovascular physiology and pharmacology. We focus on how physiological and pathological situations alter vascular cells. Uh, the title of her lecture today is Glycocalyx Degradation is Induced by COVID-19. So, Professor Simone, Thank you very much for the availability to participate in this event. So I will give you the floor. Uh, good morning to everyone. Um, Professor Alini, can, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes? OK. Uh, are you share my screen? Can you see my screen? Everyone can see? Yes. Yes. Perfect. So uh, good morning again. Uh, as Professor Aline told, my name is Simone, and uh, currently I'm a professor at Minas Gerais State University. 
And uh, the title of my work today is Glycocalyx Degradation is Induced by COVID-19. So uh, this uh, research uh, was performed in Ribeirão Preto Medical School in the last year under supervision of Professor uh, Rita Tosts. And I was doing my postdoc in University of Sao Paulo. And these are the co-authors of this work. And Tiago uh, Costa, the first speaker, uh, worked in this research together with me. So uh, here, uh, let the, the pointer here. Yes. So here we can see a blood vessel and we can see uh, vascular smooth muscle cells. Above uh, vascular smooth muscle cells uh, is a layer of endothelial cells. And also above endothelial cells, we have uh, the glycocalyx. So in this image, uh, we can see better the glycocalyx. Here is uh, endothelial cells and the cavalier structure. And we can see the glycocalyx. So the glycocalyx is a... Uh, glycoproteins uh, that stay attached in endothelial cells and is composed uh, mainly by heparin sulfate chains. In the red color, we can see the heparin sulfate chains. And uh, the protein uh, is attached to heparin sulfate chains and is inserted in endothelial cells. So we can see the glypican 1, syndecan 1, syndecan 2, 3, and 4 uh, compose the glycocalyx layer. Also, the glycocalyx is composed by hyaluronic acid in the green color, as we can see in this image. And the glycocalyx has a lot of functions uh, in the vascular field. Uh, glycocalyx can act as a barrier and selective filter. The glycocalyx work as a protector of vascular cells. Uh, also, glycocalyx prevents uh, leukocyte adhesion. Uh, avoid the antitrobotic uh, events. Also, the glycocalyx is, is pro-angiogenic. And uh, the main function that I have been working with the glycocalyx is about the mechanotransduction. So what is the mechanotransduction? Uh, the mechanotransduction uh, is when the glycocalyx work as a sensor of the shear stress. So when the cells of the blood or when the diameter of the vessel decreases, uh, increasing uh, the blood pressure values, uh, the shear stress increases, and the glycocalyx can uh, sense this, uh, can work as a sensor, and the glycocalyx activate nitric oxide production by uh, activation of endothelial nitric oxide synthesis. So the, the glycocalyx uh, mediates the mechanotransduction. Since the glycocalyx has a lot of uh, important uh, functions in the vascular field, when the glycocalyx is not present, is not uh, is degraded, we have a lot of problems in the cardiovascular vessels, the vascular vessels. So when we have the disruption of the glycocalyx uh, because uh, its degradation, we have a loss of coagulation control and activation of thrombotic events. We have a loss of antioxidant defense since the uh, superoxide uh, dismutase stay attached to the glycocalyx, to the glycoproteins in endothelial cells. Also, a degradation of the glycocalyx uh, compromise uh, the leukocyte and platelet adhesion. Also, uh, the disruption of the glycocalyx uh, promotes edema formation. And also we have an impairment of the mechanotransduction. Then uh, the vasorelaxation is uh, impaired. But what promotes the degradation of the glycocalyx? So when we have uh, increased levels of uh, cytokines and also when we have an increased level of reactive oxygen species, both cytokines and reactive oxygen species can activate heparinase. So heparinase is an uh, enzyme that cleaves heparin sulfate chains. And as I told you in the beginning, uh, heparin sulfate chains is uh, the main uh, 
protein present in the glycocalyx. So when heparinase is activated, cleave this heparin sulfate chains and promote the glycocalyx degradation. So the hypothesis of our work is that plasma of patients with COVID-19 promotes glycocalyx uh, degradation. Uh, in the first talk of uh, Thiago, uh, he showed his results and he used the virus, uh, the SARS-CoV virus in his experiments. But in my work, uh, we did not use any virus. We used just plasma from COVID-19 patients and also we used the uh, endothelial cells, uh, HILVAC, uh, and we treated the cells with plasma from COVID-19 patients. So here is my hypothesis. And what is the ends of my work? So the, the ends of this study was to evaluate if COVID-19 promoted glycocalyx shedding uh, to determine uh, whether plasma from COVID-19 patients induce glycocalyx degradation and also uh, to investigate if heparin avoids the glycocalyx disruption. Why I use the heparin? Heparin is an uh, anticoagulant and also heparin uh, inhibits the heparinase activity. And heparinase uh, cleave the, cleavate the heparin sulfate chains. Then uh, we used in this work plasma from COVID-19 patients and health subjects. This is the ethics commit uh, protocol number. And to check if the health subjects uh, did not have uh, COVID-19 disease, we made the test of the IgG and IgM antibodies in these patients. And as we can see in the, this image, uh, all seven health subjects were negative to IgG and IgM antibodies. And to uh, patients with COVID-19, we did the PCR to check, uh, to confirm the SARS-CoV infection. Uh, also, we did the detection of the specific antibodies IgG and IgMs that uh, were positive to all patients with uh, COVID-19. And also in this study, we used uh, health subjects, uh, men and women, and we used men and women, uh, similar numbers of men and women with, with COVID-19 uh, disease uh, were used in this study. And in, in our analysis, we split the COVID-19 group uh, in mute to severe and a critical uh, disease. Uh, of COVID-19 patients. And how we split this group? Because we checked the uh, rate of oxygen that is an indicator of a lung injury. And also we checked the, the, dime, levels, the dime levels that uh, indicate the uh, gravity of this disease. Then we performed ELISA assay. Also we performed Western blot assay. We use the fluorescent probes to check the uh, nitric oxide levels and hydrogen peroxide levels. And we did the immunofluorescence assay to confirm, it, confirm our results. results. So in the first result, I used just plasma from COVID-19 patients and from health subjects. Here, I don't have... Uh, endothelial cells yet, just plasma from the patients. So uh, we checked in the, the plasma, we checked the levels of interleukin-6, interleukin-1-beta, and we, we checked the TNF-alpha. And as we can see, uh, plasma from COVID-19 patients uh, was increased the interleukin-6 levels compared to health subjects and also the interleukin one beta uh, was increased in plasma from COVID-19 patients compared to health subjects. When we split this group and between mild to severe and the critical, we did not observe any uh, difference between levels of uh, IL-6 and IL-1 beta. And when we check, checked the TNF alpha levels, we did not observe any difference between 
COVID-19 patients and health subjects. Also, when we split this group between middle to severe and the critical, we did not observe any difference. And when we checked the stress uh, oxidative uh, through T-bars assay, we observed that the T-bars uh, level, MDA levels, uh, were increased in plasma from COVID-19 patients compared to health sub to subjects. Also, we did not observe a uh, difference between uh, this group when we split in mild to severe and the critical. So these uh, first results demonstrated that plasma from COVID-19 patients is uh, altered. So exhibit increased the cytokine and oxidative stress compared to health subjects. So the plasma are already changed, the plasma from COVID-19 patients. So in our uh, second step, uh, we also used the just plasma from this uh, health subject and COVID-19 patients, and we checked the human heparinase activity. Uh, remember that heparinase is the enzyme that degrades uh, cleavates the heparin sulfate chains that is the main uh, component of the glycocalyx. So when we checked the activity of this heparinase enzyme, we can see that uh, the activity was increased uh, in plasma from COVID-19 patients compared to health subjects. But when we split this group uh, between mild to severe and critical, we did not observe any difference. Also, in the plasma from these uh, patients, we analyzed the heparin sulfate uh, proteoglycans, and we can observe that heparin sulfate proteoglycans uh, is increased in plasma from COVID-19 patients compared to health subjects. And we did not observe any difference uh, between mild to severe and the critical uh, patients. So uh, since heparin sulfate proteoglycan is increased and also uh, heparinase activity is increased, uh, these both results indicate that the glycocalyx of COVID-19 patients is being uh, uh, degraded, is being shedding. And also we analyzed the HRL1 uh, levels that is another component of the glycocalyx. As we can see, also the hyaluron levels uh, were increased in plasma from COVID-19 patients compared to health subjects. But when we split this group between mild to severe and the critical, we did not observe any difference. So plasma from COVID-19 patients uh, is, is exhibit an uh, increased glycocalyx component components uh, compared to health subjects in indicating the glycocalyx shedding. So in, in the first, uh, in the next step, sorry, in the next step, we plated the uh, health endothelial cells, uh, human umbilical of endothelial cells. Uh, we plated it in uh, 96 wells, and we treated the cells with the plasma from COVID-19 patients and plasma from health subjects. So when we treated the HUVAC cells and we analyzed the hydrogen peroxide using the probe H2DCFA. And also when we analyzed the nitric oxide levels using the probe uh, DAF2DA, we can observe that both uh, hydrogen peroxide and nitric oxide uh, levels were decreased in HUVAX treated with plasma from COVID-19 patients. So there is a difference. When we split the COVID-19 group, we did not observe any difference between mild to severe and the critical for hydrogen peroxide, but uh, we observed an increased levels of fluorescence probe uh, DAF2DA to critical patients compared to mild to severe. Also, we checked the reactive oxygen species. So uh, we used the probe DHE that is uh, non-specific, but uh, we used it as a specific to anion, uh, superoxide anion, and also we use the 7CBA, that is a specific probe to peroxynitrite. When we check the reactive oxygen species using this both uh, probe, we did not observe a uh, difference uh, in HUVAX treated with plasma from health subjects and treated with uh, endothelial cells treated with 
uh, with plasma from COVID-19 patients. As you can see, no difference. Also, no, when we split this group between mild, severe, and critical, we did not observe any difference. But since we did not observe any difference here in uh, reactive oxygen species levels promoted by a plasma from COVID-19 patients, but we can observe difference here. So uh, plasma from COVID-19 patients changed the vascular homeostasis of Hilvex since it changed the levels of hydrogen peroxide and nitric oxide levels. Then these results indicate that plasma from COVID-19 patients decreases nitric oxide and hydrogen peroxide in endothelial cells. And in the next step, we, since uh, plasma from COVID-19 promoted this uh, decreased fluorescence in this both probe, we want to check if we, our treatment with plasma from COVID-19 uh, patients uh, were promote, uh, were impair the endothelial cells function. So we performed the, the treatment for uh, lactate the dehydrogenase. Uh, that is a uh, indicative of tissue damage. And when we treated the Hilvex with PBS was our control group. And we, when we treated the Hilvex with plasma from health subjects, and when we treated the Hilvex with plasma from COVID-19 patients, we did not observe any difference in LD8 levels. And here is our positive control. So the treatment with plasma from COVID-19 patients did not promote any uh, tissue damage or uh, any cell uh, damage. And also we used the uh, supernatant of these cells and we checked the heparin sulfate levels. And as we can see, uh, the plasma from COVID-19 patients increased the heparin sulfate levels in the supernatant of these cells compared to a treatment with plasma from health subjects and the treatment with uh, PBS. The, our control group. So this uh, demonstrated that the plasma were uh, promote the glycocalyx uh, shedding in Hilvex uh, cells. So plasma from COVID-19 patients promote the glycocalyx shedding in health endothelial cells. To confirm this result, we performed a Western blot assay. So we plated uh, Hilvex cells in six well, wells plate and we treated the cells with plasma from COVID-19 patients and plasma from health subjects. And we performed the treatment for 30 minutes, one hour, and treatment for 12 hours, and treatment for 24 hours. And as we can see, uh, we treated the also Hilvex with a PBS that was our control group. And as we can see, when we treated the Hilvex with using plasma from COVID-19 patients, uh, decreased the expression of Sindecan 1, of Glipican 1, and Sindecan 4, uh, with 30 minutes of treatment, and also with one hour of treatment. So uh, the plasma from COVID-19 patients was effective to promote the glycocalyx shedding, since decreased the expression of these specific components of the glycocalyx. Also, the treatment for 12 hours and 24 hours uh, were more expressive, as we can see, decreased the expression of Sindecan 1, Glipican 1, and Sindecan 4, compared to treatment of Hilvex with plasma from health subjects and uh, our counter group, the PBS. Also, we can see here that the plasma from COVID-19 decreased the expression of these uh, specific components of the glycocalyx. So these uh, results demonstrate that the plasma from COVID-19 patients decreased expression of uh, specific uh, glycocalyx components. And in the next step, uh, since heparinase uh, was increased in the plasma from COVID-19 patients and the heparinase is responsible to uh, cleave the heparin sulfate chance, we want to check if heparin could avoid the glycocalyx shedding, the glycocalyx uh, degradation. Then uh, 
we used the Hillvex and we treated the Hillvex with plasma from health uh, subjects and we treated the Hillvex with a uh, heparin, a uh, low molecular weight heparin, and we treated the Hillvex with plasma from uh, COVID-19 patients. And also we treated the Hillvex cells with uh, plasma from COVID-19 patients in presence of heparin uh, with a low molecular weight heparin. And we analyzed this, the same uh, proteins that we analyzed here. So as we can see, Syndecan 1, Glipican 1, and Syndecan 4. And only the treatment with plasma from COVID-19 patients decreased the expression of Syndecan 1, Glipican 1, and Syndecan 4, as we can see in the graphs uh, below. So here, decreased the expression of Syndecan 1, decreased the expression of Glipican 1, and decreased the expression of Syndecan 4. But uh, heparin treatment uh, was effective to avoid the glycocalyx shedding. So in presence of heparin, we did not observe a change in Syndecan 1 levels, Syndecan 1 expression, or Glipican 1 expression, or Syndecan 4 expression, as we can see here in this group. So uh, these results demonstrate that the treatment was with heparin was effective and avoid the glycocalyx uh, degradation in health Hillvac endothelial cells. So uh, to confirm uh, these results here, we did the immunofluorescence uh, assay. And in this immunofluorescence assay, we uh, used the glipican-1 antibody because the glipican-1 is a uh, main expression in endothelial cells. And since we were using uh, Hillvac endothelial cells, so we chose to perform uh, immunofluorescence for glipican-1, just for glipican-1. And in the first line, we have uh, Hillvac uh, treated with a PBS. In the second line, we have Hillvac treated with uh, plasma from health subjects. And in the third line, we have uh, Hillvac treated with plasma from uh, COVID-19 patients. And in the last line, we have the Hillvac treated with plasma from COVID-19 patients in presence of heparin, of low molecular weight uh, heparin. And as we can see, here is our uh, the nucleus of the cells. Here uh, is the mark for endothelial cells. Here is our target, the glipican one. Here we merged the endothelial cells with the uh, nucleus. And here we made a zoom of these specific areas was, as we can see. And the treatment with plasma from COVID-19 patients decreased the fluorescence for glipican-1, as we can see in the image, and we can see in the graph here. And when we uh, did the together uh, the treatment with heparin and also plasma from COVID-19 patients, uh, was heparin was effective to uh, avoid the decrease of fluorescence, as we can see. So heparin avoid the decrease of immunofluorescence for glipican-1. So these uh, results confirmed the results uh, that we demonstrated here, the, that the heparin is effective to avoid the glycocalyx shedding. Then, uh, taken together, uh, these results demonstrate that plasma from health subjects uh, did not demonstrate uh, in the beginning of the experiment, did not dem demonstrate uh, oxidative stress or interleukine levels in plasma from health subjects. So when we treated uh, health endothelial cells with this uh, plasma, uh, endothelial, endothelial cells uh, presented a redox balance and a regular inflammatory cycle. Also, the glycocalyx uh, remained intact and endothelial function was kept 
in during the treatment since, since we did not observe a uh, difference in nitric oxide levels or hydrogen peroxide levels in, in the telio cells treated with plasma from health subjects. But when we treated the HILVAC cells with plasma from COVID-19 patients, we uh, observed in the beginning of the experiments that the plasma from these patients present uh, oxidative stress, also present the uh, in interleukin 6 and interleukin 1 beta uh, increased the levels. And when we perform the treatment of health endothelial cells with this uh, plasma, we observed a redox a disbalance since the plasma from COVID-19 patients decreased the nitric oxide levels and decreased the hydrogen peroxide levels. Also, we observed that the plasma from COVID-19 patients uh, promote glycocalyx uh, degradation, glycocalyx shedding, and this in, uh, reduced the uh, endothelial dysfunction. And when we used a uh, heparin, low molecular weight heparin, uh, we observed that uh, avoided the glycocalyx shedding and the glycocalyx uh, degradation. So this is uh, our conclusion. And I want to thank the all co-authors that uh, helped us to perform these experiments. I want to thank uh, the lab toasts, uh, the lab toasts uh, students. And I want to thank the organization of International Symposium on Biological Science to invite me to make the presentation today, especially Professor uh, Manuel Biancardi that made the invitation to me. And I want to make, I want to thank you the financial support, CAPS, CNPQ, and FAPESP. And this is uh, my contact if it, someone uh, has questions after or want to make contact and some collaboration. So this, thank you for everyone. Thank you very much, Professor Simone, for this enlightening lecture. Now we are open to questions. Uh, we have um, a question from Larissa Matuda Macedo. She asks, uh, congrats, Simone and Thiago. Uh, did your group study these mechanisms in diabetic patients with plasma from diabetic patient, patients? So uh, thank you for the question, Larissa. Uh, we did not uh, use the plasma from diabetic patients, but uh, now, I think in this moment in uh, Tostas lab, uh, there are some students uh, using plasma from uh, obesity uh, uh, subjects and using plasma from diabetic patients uh, doing uh, both experiments to check if there is some uh, difference in, not in the glycocalyx, but in, in other uh, mechanisms. And we have uh, another question from Professor Diego Basilico Bunyati. Uh, in the beginning, we have seen huge expect expectations about the convalescent plasma treatment for COVID-19. Based on your data, do you think that it could be an issue? I, I don't know, because I... Thank you for your question, Professor Diego. I read about the convalescent plasma, but... Uh, there is a lot of studies in this moment in Brazil and, and in the world uh, using convalescent plasma, but I, I don't know if it's a, a good idea. I think it, we need to study more. And uh, I think it, the SARS-CoV study is in the beginning in the, the world. I think we don't know nothing until now <laughs> about the COVID-19 disease. Okay, another question from uh, João Batista. Thanks for presentation. Is it fair to say that the glycocalyx degradation can explain the higher gravity of SARS-CoV-2 when compared to other coronavirus? Yes, yes, uh, because the, the uh, critical patients with COVID-19 disease uh, demonstrated the glycocalyx uh, degradation. So explain the gravity of the 
uh, disease, uh, mainly in lungs and in the kidneys. I used the endothelial cells. I did not use a specific endothelial cells from the lungs or from the kidney, but uh, there are other groups that are studying uh, the glycocalyx degradation in lungs and kidney. And this expands the uh, gravity of the disease. And also we observed in uh, Ribeirão Preto Medical School that some patients that present the COVID-19 disease, but was immune to severe, they were not uh, in the hospital. They confirmed the COVID-19 patients and they come back home to stay home and uh, uh, wait the, the steps of the disease. But some months later, they come back to the hospital from Ribeirão Preto Medical School, and they were with the uh, coagulations and thrombo thrombosis problems in the lungs since uh, associated to glycocalyx degradation. Thank you, Simone. Another question uh, from Professor Fernanda Giacchini. Uh, Simone, this was an excellent talk when you showed interleucin-6 and interleucin-1-beta levels not serving patients. Uh, the level were increased. However, he continues the question. However, it, is it possible to observe that several COVID? It's possible to observe that several COVID nineteen patients did not show increased cyto, cytosine levels. It's like the COVID group displayed two separate profiles. Have you noticed it? Yes, thank you, Professor Fernando, to your question. Uh, we noticed this. We observed this, and uh, the plasma from our patients. Uh, was collected uh, when after five days that the patients were in the hospital. So in the beginning of the disease, but some patients uh, stay in the hospital for 15, uh, 20, 30 days. And when we use the plasma from uh, these patients after uh, the five days, we did not observe any difference in, in interleukine uh, 6 or 1 beta or 10 F alpha. We did not observe any difference. So just in the beginning, uh, I sorry I did not told this in my presentation, but the plasma from our patients was collected between the five uh, beginning days of the disease. Uh, thank you, Professor Simone. I have a question: uh, How long uh, for the cells to recover? Uh, the, gly the glycocalyx function. Do you, do you think that the post-COVID syndrome could be related to the persistent damage in glycocalyx? Yes, I think yes. We we want to make this uh, uh, perform uh, the treatment with plasma and take out the plasma and check how long uh, it's possible to recover the glycocalyx. But some groups uh, did the perform the she's stress in endothelial cells, and they observed that uh, syndecan one and glipecan one can recover uh, 30 minutes after the she's stress is, is stimulated. But uh, these cells was uh, in a good conditions. But in conditions with uh, COVID-19 patients, I think there is no study in this moment. So it's a good question, Professor. Aline, and I want to keep doing uh, this research, but I need to come back to Ribeirão Preto <laughs> to do the experiments. Yes, and uh, um, another question about um, the renin angiotensin system. Um, since the SARS-CoV uh, needs to needs the heparin sulfate to um, binding to AC2. Uh, what do you think about the renin angiotensin system as a therapeutic approach? Do you think that uh, this could be a better approach just with association to heparin or not? I, I don't know. I really don't know. I, I think it's uh, very complicated because there is a, a different uh, pathways uh to to do the experiments and uh, different paths to the disease 
So I really don't know because uh, the, the SARS-CoV uh, degrades the SARS-CoV infection, degrades the glycocalyx buzz, but also the virus need the heparin sulfate to attach to the cell. So I really don't know to answer your question. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. It's... That, that in, indeed, there is a lot of questions to be yes. answered in the SARS-CoV, especially with uh, these new variants too. Probably uh, this uh, shedding on glycocalyx could be more, uh, more intense in these new variants. Uh, do you think this could be? Yes, I think so. Because I think the, the virus is uh, changed uh, his uh, mechanism to attach the, and to infect the cells improve the, the mechanism. Yes. Uh, any more questions? I have a question if we have time. So, Simone, yes, thank you for your, for your talk. And this um, post-COVID syndrome is when the symptom persists over four weeks from their onset. And then uh, you show that you took samples for uh, from patients from the beginning um, i don't remember if you said five days or something and do you have any data on glycocalyx uh, degradation in the participation of the system in post-covid syndrome patients i mean in the long lasting symptoms the sequela from the sars cov 2 infection no but we have uh, the samples in in the minus 8 in our freezer in Ribeirão Preto because we collected the the blood in uh the first day of the patients were in the hospital in the second the five uh i think the seven but we we made a scale between 30 days and some patients uh died but we in other patients we made the collection of blood do, during the 30 days and we want to keep doing the experiments but i was in the united states for some months <laughs> doing uh a postdoc this year and now i'm back to brazil is i have been in brazil for two months and i want to continue the experiment and uh answer your question because i think it's important yeah, I, I suppose you would follow up this, these patients. This is why I've asked it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question, Professor Carlos. Thank you again, Professor Simone, for being here and sharing your, uh, uh, such interesting data. And now uh, we going to the next, ne next speaker. Uh, and the next lecture, uh, will be given by the researcher Hayani Alves Freitas. Uh, Hayani has a degree in pharmacy by the Federal University of Mato Grosso, Universidade Federal de Mato Grosso, where she's also earned her master's degree in basic and applied immunology and parasitology. And currently, she's a PhD student in biological science at the Federal University of Goiás, Universidade Federal de Goiás in the Laboratory of Vascular Biology and Histopathology. Uh, the title of her lecture is Interleucin-10 Mediates Anticontractual Effects of Perivascular Adipose Tissue and Vascular Remodeling Prevention. Hayani, thank you very much for your presence and for your ability to share your research and knowledge with us. Now I, I'll give you the floor. Okay, Professor, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Hayani. I am a PhD student of the graduate program in biological science, cursing the second year. Uh, I will present now uh, my project entitled as Interleukin 10 Mediates Anticontractual Effect of Perivascular Adipose Tissue and Vascular Remodeling Prevention. And my advisor is Fernanda Giacchini. Uh, so, arteries are blood vessels responsible for carrying oxygen and nutrients to all cells and tissues in the body. Uh, these vessels are composed of endothelial cells, vascular smooth muscle cells, and extracellular matrix components, including the collagen and the elastic fibers. 
uh, these components composing three important tunicas in these vessels, the intima, media, and external. Uh, any alteration in the structure or the composition can cause the vascular remodeling, and the balance of these components are responsible for the controlling of the vascular tone and the ideal rhythm of the blood flow. Moreover, uh, surrounding the arteries is a layer of perivascular adipose tissue, the pivet. Uh, this tissue is specialized in storing lipids in adipose cells, also called adipocytes. Uh, this tissue has important functions, like a protective barrier, energy and thermal source, and the endocrine action. Uh, there are four types of adipose cells. The white tissue is more associated with the energy storage and the endocrine action. The pink cells is more involved with the milk production during pregnant and the energy storage. Uh, the beige tissue is one association of the white tissue and the brown tissue. And finally, the brown tissue is more associated with uh, the thermal uh, storage because the high number of mitochondria in these cells. Uh, in general, the white tissue is more associated with the inflammation because the high release of substances in the endocrine action by the cells, while the brown tissue is more associated with the metabolic activity. Uh, it's important to mention that pivot, the white tissue or the brown tissue, can change their phenotype according to the anatomical region of uh, this tissue in the body or local and systemic stimulation like a treatment, a temperature and other stimulations. Uh, pivet is also composed of other cells including immune cells and extracellular matrix components. Uh, all these cells, mainly immune cells and adipose cells, can produce and release substances, also called adipokines. Uh, these adipokines, such as adiponectin, leptin, growth factors, and interleukins have different uh, actions and functions in the vasculature and other tissues. In fact, uh, the pivet is a broad source that releases substances directly into the vasculature. In one physiological state, these substances can reduce the contractual response, one anti-contractual effect by pivet, uh, attenuated vascular inflammation, reduce aphrogenic factors, and reduce tissue damage. So, in one physiological state, uh, the presence of pivet is beneficial and protective to the vasculature. And one important mediator released by the pivet is the interleukin 10. Uh, interleukin 10 has several essential functions to maintain tissue integrity and homeostasis during physiological process. Uh, the cytokine uh, promotes uh, important and protective effects in the vasculature and other tissues. In fact, the cytokine has been used as a treatment for immune disease. However, uh, the role of IL-10 in the vascular structure and composition and the role of IL-10 as a mediator of the pivot effects on the vasculature remains unclear. For it, uh, the goals of this study was to evaluate the role of IL-10 in vascular remodeling and the mediator of the anti-contractive effect of pivot. Uh, for it, we are used male mice with C57 in age and animals knockout for IL-10 with age 12 weeks. First, uh, we remove the thorax aorta of these animals and separate in different groups. First, the thorax aorta without the pivot. Second, with the presence of pivot. And finally, the pivot isolated. Uh, until now, we perform the histology, 
to analyze the vascular morphometry, elastic fibers, and collagen deposition. Uh, vascular reactivity uh, to evaluate the contractile effect mediated by phenylephrine in the 10 micromolar concentration. And uh, Western blot to evaluate the uncoupling protein 1, the UCP1 expression. Uh, that's one important marker of the brown adipose tissue. Uh, so, in the morphological analysis, uh, the endogenous absence of IL-10 promotes a reduction in the pivot area, as observed in this figure, the reduction in the pivot area compared to control animals. Uh, we also observe an increase in the vascular area and in the vascular thickness suggesting a vascular hypertrophy in the absence of IL-10. Uh, in the analysis of extracellular matrix components, we observed an increase in the percentage of collagen deposition, as observed in this figure, using the picrocereus dye. We also observed a reduction in the percentage of elastic fibers using the resourcing dye. So, uh, in these conditions, in the increase of collagen deposition and the reduction of the elastic fibers can uh, impair the resistance and the elasticity of these vessels. And consequently, these conditions can alter the vascular tone. Uh, in the protein analysis, the IL-10 knockout animals demonstrate a reduction in the UCP1 expression in the pivot tissue compared to control animals. Uh, the UCP1 is one protein responsible for the heat production uh, in the mitochondria present in the brown adipose tissue. Uh, in fact, in the morphological analysis, we observed more brown adipose tissue phenotype in the pivot of control animals. However, in knockout animals, we observe more white adipose tissue phenotype. In fact, uh, in, the in the physiological state, the pivot of thorax aorta naturally is more associated with the brown adipose tissue phenotype. However, in the absence of IL-10, we observe one tissue more associated with the white adipose tissue phenotype, more involved with the inflammation, frequently observed in some conditions like hypertension, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. Uh, finally, in the vascular reactivity, the presence of pivet reduced the vascular contraction induced by phenylephrine in the 10 micromolar concentration in control animals. So uh, that is an uh, anti-contractile effect of the pivot in control animals. Uh, it's already well uh, established. On the other hand, uh, the endogenous absence of IL-10 results in an increase in the vascular contraction compared to control animals. So uh, the animals knockout for IL-10 uh, naturally presents change in the vascular structure and composition, and one increase in the expression proteins involved in vascular contraction. So these alterations can uh, um, impair the vascular contraction in these animals. In addition, the absence of IL-10 results in an elevated blood pressure and cardiovascular dysfunction. However, the presence of pivet in thorax aorta from IL-10 knockout animals does not reduce the vascular contraction. So uh, these results demonstrate uh, in the absence of IL-10, the pivet does not promote your anti-contractile effect. Uh, so, uh, it's important to mention the important function of the IL-10 for this effect. Uh, in conclusion, uh, the IL-10 plays an essential role in the vascular composition and function by preventing vascular remodeling and mediating the anticontractile effect of pivot in the vasculature.
uh, in the next steps, I will evaluate other important uh, components of the morphological analysis, like uh, adipocyte size and different types of collagen. Uh, the inflammatory cytokine profile released by PIVET and important mediators of the extracellular matrix components like metalloproteinases and thumbs. So all these results uh, will demonstrate the role of IL-10 in the vascular structure, uh, in the vascular function and in the vascular homeostasis. Thank you to my lab and colleagues Thank you, the universities, that I can perform my project and the development agencies, HIPS and CNPQ. Uh, thank you very much. Hi, Annie. Thank you very much for your presence and for your availability to share your research with us again. Um, and now we are open to questions. I think, Carlos, do you want to, or do you want that I read or you read the, the questions? It's okay for me to read. Let's see. Okay. Uh, we have. Um, Dr. Rodrigo question, Dr. Rodrigo Gomes. Uh, he's saying it's a very interesting your UCP data in the PV tissue. And I guess the questions come through. How is the adrenergic response in PVAT? Uh, about the receptors, Professor. Uh, I don't remember to see about the adrenergic function and these receptors. I'm sorry. But uh, in the functions of the pivot, it's uh, interesting to observe the effect of pivot in one physiological state compared to a pathological state. So maybe these components and receptors is different. So it's important to uh, consider the conditions that you uh, think that you make your question. Yeah, he's extending the questions for beta one and beta three receptors. Beta two and beta three receptors. Sorry. Yes, I see. But uh, how I say, I I don't remember to see about the adrenergic functions, but and the receptors involved in the pivot. Uh, but it's important uh, to consider the conditions that you make your question because the pivot is different in some conditions. So in physiological states, you have pathological states in diabetes, hypertension, and the other conditions. So uh, I will see it more. Okay. So next question comes from Dr. Diego Colognacci. Uh, it's a great talk and results. Do you know if in obesity, the phenotype of the pivot is different? Yes, of course. Yes, uh, the pivot is a modulator tissue. So in one physiological state, uh, the pivot is beneficial and protective. Uh, uh, release that just substances uh, protective to the vasculature and other tissues. So the endocrine action by uh, the pivot in one physiological state is so protective. However, in the obesity, diabetes, hypertension, the pivot change your structure, your composition, um, the release that the mediators release it by this uh, tissue. So uh, is uh, different, completely different, and uh, in all these inflammatory disease and inflammatory conditions, the pivot change. Okay. Um, following Dr. Thiago Costa is greeting you for your very nice talk, and he asks, did you evaluate the mitochondrial function in the NIM pivot of IL-10 keomice? No, no, just the 
uh, UCP1 expression because uh, the UCP1 is one uh, marker of the brown adipose tissue and my uh, goals of in this study is evaluate the difference of the phenotype. So one phenotype more associated with the white tissue or the brown tissue. So I I didn't evaluate the mitochondria function, but it's a, a good uh, idea for the next steps. Okay. So the the host is forwarding a question from Dr. Simone Pochi. Ayani, congrats for your presentation. Do you think that Thank in you. your model, IL-10, could exhibit change in the expression of some specific component of glycocalyx? Uh, yes, maybe. Yes, I don't. I didn't evaluate uh, these components, uh, but uh, I think it's uh, important to consider this effect because all these chains uh, in these components in the uh, structure and composition can cause the vascular remodeling. So. I think it's important to consider it too. So mm. subsequently, she invites you to do some collaboration as, as for our, if yes, we could test the samples of your animals in Tostes labs in Ribeirão Preto Medical School. So she's welcoming you to do something together. Yes, <laughs> my animals from there. <laughs> okay, Dr. Alini, do you have further questions? No, just uh, was an excellent lecture and uh, in fact this this kind of uh, relationship between interleucin 10 in the anti-contractor effect in pivet it's a kind contradictory in the literature um, I've, I've been seeing some studies showed showing that um, there is no relationship uh, of interleucin 10 in this anti-contractor effect in health condition. Um, but you showed that yes, could be. Yes. Do you think that uh, there is um, um, epigenetic uh, um, condition that could predispose more to this uh, dysfunction in some pathological um, condition like obesity, mm -hmm. like diabetes? I would, I would like that you talk more about this, your perception that you work with this. <laughs> yes, thank you, Professor. Uh, in the first talk about your sentence, uh, yes, I remember this paper. I don't know, but I think this paper is the Stephanie Watts. I don't know, but uh, Stephanie Watts uh, recently published the one uh, paper about the association with the interleukin 10 and the pivot. And uh, she uh, doesn't see uh, uh, nothing different in this. So IL-10 uh, don't uh, contribute to the anti-contractor effect of pivot in the health. But in this paper, she used the mesenteric arteries so in mesenteric arteries have a uh, um, phenotype more associated with the white adipose tissue and in my study i use uh, the thorax aorta so thorax aorta have a phenotype more associated with the brown adipose tissue so uh, these conditions can change uh, in different tissues and the regions and atomic regions in this tissue so uh, the first is it, and I remember this paper <laughs> too, and it's so nice. Uh, and about the model, yes, I agree. Uh, the animals knockout for IL-10 naturally presents these chances, alterations in the vasculature and other uh, tissues and organs. Uh, however, in the next steps, I want to evaluate the endogenous uh, function of the IL-10 and the exogenous function of the IL-10. So I think the exogenous function of the IL-10, like an incubation with the cytokine in the pivot, in the aortic tissue, can uh, respond better these questions about this model animal. 
So I think it's necessary more studies uh, to evaluate the endogenous role and the exogenous role is uh, really important now. Thank you, Hayani. Thank you very much for all your answers. Thank um, you. Is there any more question? I... So Alini, why do people take takes time to to um Tiago asked some questions, sorry. Yes, I think I'm that sorry. I don't know if you we've read the his question, I think not. Yeah, I just took it now. Yeah. <laughs> so the question is in IL ten KO animals, what is the phenotype of white pivate mesenteric arteries? Are there any changes? Uh, yes, yes. I told you, Professor, <laughs> recently about it. Uh, yes, uh, in the different arteries of the body, uh, different uh, anatomical region in the body has different phenotype of pivot. So in one uh, thorax aorta, uh, we have uh, a phenotype more associated with the brown adipose tissue so more involved with the metabolic activity. However, in the mesenteric arteries, uh, we have a um, pivot more associated with the white adipose tissue. So more involved with the endocrine action and the release of substances and more associated with the inflammation naturally. So uh, yes, have differences uh, is, um, very important to note this difference in some conditions because in one inflammatory disease uh, like hypertension, uh, cardiovascular disease, obesity, uh, these conditions can change too. And so, you know, these conditions, uh, inflammatory conditions, this pivot can change your phenotype to white adipose tissue more associated with the endocrine action and inflammation. So the pivot change uh, according the anatomical region and according the conditions of this patient. I think is it. <laughs> Thank you, Hayani. So I um, you. She's having a lot of prizes from the audience including the, the, the program of biological science. It looks like the, the way you proceed is uh, reflects the, the quality of the students this program wants to, to graduate. So congratulations <laughs> thank for you, you very and much. for all the students that have been presented these days. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. So um, now we will take a break of uh, these presentations for everybody take a little coffee and be prepared for the next round of lectures uh, we will return at at 10 and 15 a.m thank you thank you everyone everybody for watching us thank you bye-bye <laughs>